Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the motion and I thank Dr. Wan Rizal, Mr. Edward Chia, Ms. Mariam Jaffa, Dr. Tan Wu Meng and Mr. Yip Hon Wing for moving this motion as well as all members who have spoken passionately about the issue. Mental health has grown in importance both in Singapore and across the world. In the past, people dealt with mental health issues privately. It was always in the shadows. It's not something we talked about publicly. In recent times, attitudes have shifted for the better. People are more informed about mental health and more willing to talk about this openly. COVID-19 also brought mental health issues to the forefront because across the world, people had to cut back social interactions and isolate themselves from family and friends. And this took a toll on mental health. It happened in Singapore too. After the circuit breaker was introduced, we observed an increase in the utilization of mental health services and more calls to IMH's mental health helpline. And that's why we set up the COVID-19 Mental Wellness Task Force, which later became the Interagency Task Force on Mental Health and Wellbeing, chaired by SMS Janil. The work of the task force builds on previous national efforts to improve the quality and accessibility of mental health services in Singapore. The task force has published the National Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy, which sets out concrete plans to plug existing gaps and to strengthen our mental health ecosystem. We will now translate these plans into action. Our plans are not static. We will continue to evolve and update them, including taking on board the many useful suggestions from members in this debate. So let there be no doubt, the government is making mental health and well-being a key priority in our national agenda. Uh, to understand the approach in this new strategy, we must first appreciate the full range of mental health issues. On one end of the spectrum are mental health issues that require medical treatment, like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. These conditions can be debilitating, severely affecting a person's ability to carry out important daily activities. On the other end of the spectrum are issues affecting mental well-being, like anxiety and stress. While these typically do not require medicalization, it does not mean that we should take them lightly. If not addressed well, poor mental well-being can also affect our ability to lead our lives productively. And because mental health issues lie on a spectrum, it means we need a broad suite of solutions. Not all mental health issues need to be treated in a specialist healthcare institution. It's the same when we have a physical ailment. We don't go to a specialist for treatment immediately when we experience symptoms of ill health. Instead, we first see our family doctor, and if it's more serious, the matter gets referred to specialist care. So improving mental health is not just about hiring more psychiatrists or building more capacity at the IMH. We certainly will do that, but we also need to strengthen capabilities across our entire spectrum of care, including at our polyclinics and GPs, and across other settings like schools, workplaces, and the community, so that more timely support can be rendered to those in need. In our strategy, we are redoubling our efforts to better understand the issues that young people face, something that many members spoke about. It has never been easy to be a teenager Teenage angst has always been part of the growing up process. Teenagers have to learn about themselves, take on new responsibilities, and prepare for adulthood. But something has changed around the world since around the early 2010s, because the current generation of young people are expressing more concerns about their mental health than previous cohorts. Many countries have reported increases in suicidal ideation as well as mental health conditions like anxiety and depression amongst their youths. Last year, the U.S. Surgeon General called the increasing mental health needs of U.S. youth as the, quote, defining public health crisis of our time. Even the Nordic countries, consistently ranking high in global happiness and well-being surveys, they too are reporting 
rises in youth anxiety, depression, and a variety of mental illnesses. Uh, we see a similar trend in Singapore. It's not at the same high levels as some other countries where the mental health issues are conflated with other difficult issues like drug abuse, homelessness, and street violence. But it is nevertheless a worrying trend, and we are taking it seriously. So we are linking up with researchers from around the world to try and understand the root causes behind this recent search in youth mental health issues. Some think that heavy social media usage is a major cause. Indeed, the constant pressure to present a positive image online, the fear of missing out, algorithms that flood news feeds with stories that are designed to spark outrage, the issues of cyberbullying, all these can take a toll on one's mental health. Uh, furthermore, the more time spent on the internet or social media means more sleep deprivation, less physical exercise, and less real-life interactions, all of which are important for healthy brain development at a young age. But other researchers think that there is more to it, that it's not just about more online safeguards, that we also need to loosen up in the real world and give our children more space for free play and autonomy. Because when children have less room to play and explore or to interact and build social skills at an early age, they are also less likely to grow up with the sense of independence and confidence to take charge of their own lives. The bottom line is that more work will need to be done to better understand what has changed globally in recent years. It's an area that requires further research and study to identify the key causal factors and the interplay between the factors so that we can design and put in place appropriate interventions based on data and evidence to better help our young people. So these are some of the considerations behind our national strategies. And let me highlight quickly several key moves we will be making with several targets we aim to achieve by 2030 or earlier. We will increase capacity at the IMH and the redeveloped Alexandra Hospital for those that need specialist care. Capacity at long-term care facilities will also be increased to provide step-down care for those who need it. We will increase the number of public sector psychiatrists and psychologists by about 30% and 40% respectively. We will introduce mental health services to all polyclinics and 900 more GP clinics. We will equip and train an additional 28,000 frontline personnel and volunteers. They serve across our community and social service touch points so they can identify people struggling with mental health and offer early assistance. Uh, we will also redouble our existing efforts. MOE is on track to achieving its target of deploying more than 1,000 teacher counsellors across our schools. And this is on top of the basic counselling skills that all teachers will be trained in, as well as the one to two counsellors that every school will have to support students with more challenging social and emotional needs. We will provide parents with resources to support their children's mental health and well-being needs. We will establish more peer support networks in the community, including in schools, institutions of higher learning, workplaces, and amongst our national servicemen. These networks will have trained peer leaders who can spread the message on the importance of mental health and provide a first line of response to their friends or colleagues who need help. My colleagues, SPS Rahayu and Eric Chua, MOS Gan and SMS Janil will elaborate later on some of these areas. These are significant moves. They will require more coordinated efforts across the government, more training, more people, and ultimately more government spending. But we will set aside the resources to advance this important agenda. Uh, through these moves, we aim to reduce waiting times and make mental health services more accessible and closer to where individuals are, be it at homes, schools, or workplaces. We aim to keep mental health services affordable and we will do so through our national healthcare financing framework of government subsidies and the three M's, which will cover all cost-effective mental health treatments. Importantly, no one in Singapore will be denied access to appropriate care because of inability to pay. Several members also spoke about private insurance coverage outside of healthcare, including in areas like life insurance. Life insurers in Singapore have, in fact, offered coverage to persons with mental health conditions. 
But the underwriting of such persons can be a complex matter as our, as our own data is limited and insurers here typically reference the underwriting guidelines of global life reinsurers. So we will study and review how this coverage can be improved and ensure that financial institutions deal fairly with all their customers, including those with mental health conditions. Importantly, we will have a bigger focus on preventive care so that everyone can take proactive steps and take charge of their own mental health. We will start young in schools. We want our children to develop good cyber habits so they learn to use the internet and social media safely and responsibly. To be clear, our approach is not to remove all stress. That is not going to help our children. Instead, we want our children to learn to deal with stress at age-appropriate levels. We want them to develop self-belief and resilience and grow up with the confidence to tackle challenges, stresses and demands that they will surely encounter later in life. Uh, we will continue to integrate mental well-being into our healthier SG and other preventive health programs. Uh, we sometimes think of body and mind as separate entities, but they are closely linked, each affecting the other greatly. So staying active, exercising regularly, connecting with friends in person, not online, learning new skills, contributing to a larger purpose. All these sound like commonsensical advice, but they are not so easy to do, and they are foundational habits that will enable all of us to improve our overall well-being. Uh, sir, the government is fully committed to doing more to improve mental health and well-being. But for all these plans to work, we also need to change our attitudes and mindsets. We need to do more to destigmatize mental health conditions so that people do not hesitate to seek help. Stigma reduces a complex and difficult problem into unhelpful labels and stereotypes. It often it opens people struggling with mental health to discrimination, such as in the job market. It may cause them to be socially ostracized. It makes them feel ashamed, isolated, and stops them from seeking treatment. As I mentioned just now, we do see attitudes shifting, but the stigma remains. We know that, and we can do much more to build a society where we help one another cope with life's stresses and are considerate of each other's feelings and carve out space, safe spaces for them. We also need to change our mindsets about what we consider success in life. It's good to have a culture in Singapore that values hard work, promotes excellence, and encourages everyone to aspire and strive to do better. But we should not be unwittingly drawn into a red race of hyper-competition and endless comparisons with one another just to get ahead of others but end up worse off as a society. In fact, this was one of the key points from our Forward Singapore engagements. The vast majority of Singaporeans wish to see a more inclusive Singapore dream, one where we are not pressured to conform to narrow definitions of success where we embrace excellence and talents across many different areas and find meaning and purpose in what we do. The government is making policy moves in this direction by reviewing our education system, narrowing wage gaps and strengthening safety nets so that everyone can be better assured of their basic needs at every life stage and can have the space to venture forth and be the best version of ourselves. But we cannot make this happen through policy alone. Our attitudes, our mindsets must also change and align with our shared aspirations for a refreshed Singapore dream. Indeed, to achieve all of these goals, we must work together. Now, there are many ground-up initiatives and community and social services organisations already working in different ways to meet the mental health and well-being needs of Singaporeans. I know from personal experience, having served as patron to the Samaritan of Singapore for more than 10 years, the SOS, I've interacted with many of the volunteers there and have seen firsthand their commitment and dedication to save lives. We value the collaboration and partnership with all of you. 
Through the SG Mental Wellbeing Network, we have been linking up with many groups and volunteers to address the diverse needs of our people, be it befriending lonely seniors or providing a safe space for youths to talk about their mental health struggles. The setting up of the National Mental Health Office will enable us to coordinate these partnership efforts more effectively and to better synergize and maximize our efforts on the ground. So I call on all Singaporeans who are passionate about this issue of mental health and well-being to join us in this national movement. We have lots to do and a full agenda ahead of us. The government has set out clear plans and deliverables, but the issues are complex and we do not have all the answers. We want everyone on board so that we learn together and continue to fine-tune our strategies based on your feedback and ideas and our shared experiences and insights. Together, let us build a Singapore where everyone matters, where everyone has a place and where everyone belongs. Together, hand in hand, let us improve the mental health and well-being of all Singaporeans. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I support the motion. Thank you.